Hi, this is D. Knight, and I am speaking to former prosecutor Eric Lasson. I'd like to welcome him to the show. Uh, he is going to be providing us some information and some analysis on the developments over the course of this Trump trial here in Manhattan. Eric, it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. And so earlier today, there was a contempt hearing for Donald Trump's numerous violations of his gag order, his court imposed gag order out of, of out of 10 proposed violations. Uh, the judge found that he met the standard of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt for nine of them. And just, you know, as part of your experience as a former prosecutor, I guess, generally speaking, like how often is it that you even see an individual being <laughs> held in contempt in violation of a gag order, not just once, but multiple times. Very rare. I mean, I've never seen it at all, actually. I've seen uh, threats by the judge, um, and I've seen a few cases where there's been uh, sort of a summary contempt where it happens in the courtroom, uh, which which under most state laws, the judge can immediately act upon without a separate proceeding, where somebody's been locked up for a day. I, I once saw it overnight. But I've never seen this type of uh, continuous back and forth and and really a daring by uh the defendant of the judge to do anything and in fact it's worked for mr trump in all of his cases so far because nobody's ever called him out for him in the civil fraud trial he was fined by the judge there on and goron but uh even though the judge was furious and mr trump had brazenly crossed the line there was no sanction and I, among many people, have always pointed out that unless and until um, there's detention, it's really unlikely that Trump is going to stop or modify his behavior. So we'll see here. Um, I think Judge Mershon and the district attorney's office all understood that they couldn't do much off the bat, even though they said these were egregious violations. They didn't act immediately. They waited a week to have the hearing, and then the violations kept piling up. Obviously, the fine amount of $1,000 is risible. It's just symbolic. It's not going to have any effect. But maybe the warning that the next time, we mean it, if the next time you do it, um, we won't just give you a stern talking to, we might incarcerate you. Maybe this time, among all other times, uh, alone among all the times, this has gotten Trump's attention. This is something we're we're only going to find out as each day goes by. I, I note that already today he had more attacks on the judge, which is not a violation of the gag order. But he's you know obviously going to continue going after the judge, and and I find it hard to imagine that he's going to restrain um, going after Michael Cohen again. Uh, whenever he testifies. And and I think each day is going to be a, a volcano. And then if it happens, the real test then for credibility is whether the judge actually incarcerates Trump. He clearly doesn't want to do it. The district attorney hasn't been pushing for it. Everybody recognizes that it's a dangerous situation because, you know, we're really talking about, when we're talking about Mr. Trump's base, it's a lone wolf, kind of a lone actor uh, threat that's initiated. It's even though he might call for people to come down to the courthouse and nobody comes and that kind of thing. The real danger is there's a lot of people out there that are tuning into his rantings and his social media posts. Nobody knows where they all are. They could be anywhere. And it only takes one of them. And we've seen many instances of this to do something um, because he, he or she feels like he's been called to do it by these posts. So Absolutely. that's a big part of the, of the danger. The, the judge is just focused on the witnesses and the jurors. Um, but it's more than that. But but even the witnesses and the jurors, they're in danger if, uh, you know, we have this continued talk by Mr. Trump. And then on a separate matter, I think he was talking about if the election doesn't go his way, then he's not ruling out violence. Violence is and the call to it is never far from him. So um instead of sh my feeling is it's inevitable th this is a slow motion train wreck in terms of coming to a reckoning with trump 
and uh, and he, he's going to have to be detained next time it happens. But whether Judge Mershon buys into that, I don't know. It might mean an immediate appeal. It might mean some sort of a delay in the trial. But I don't think that's a reason not to do it if it's called for. Right. Uh, what do you think about Judge Mershon's like nuanced approach to giving Trump a break on that one count in terms of his comments about Michael Cohen, given that Cohen had been publicly making statements about Trump? Although I guess technically, uh, so Cohen tweeted that he would be refraining from making any public comments about Trump in the near future as long as the trial is proceeding. But it was still a violation of the gag order. Uh, so that it's again, it's a quick it's a case of the judge bending over backwards, trying to give uh, Trump every possible break. So if and when the hammer ever does come down, nobody can legitimately claim, you know, that Trump wasn't warned or that there's some that it's because of some infringement on his political speech rights, although those claims will inevitably occur anyway. Uh, but I think that the judge could have found a violation even on the on the one count of Michael Cohen. Um, and, you know, if he if the judge wanted to, he could amend again the the, the gag order. Uh, to my way of looking at it, um, you know, it's not really what Cohen is saying is not really a threat to Trump. Um, but when Trump responds with his much larger following, uh, and you know he's he's at once the leader of uh, of the Republican Party and uh, the leader of all these other sort of off scheduled groups or militias, uh, it's a it's a really asymmetrical threat. But if the judge wants to equate that with Michael Cohen, he's just giving him a break. But there's still nine other counts. The predicate is there. Um, if the behavior continues. It's not going to matter whether that one extra count is included there. There's a basis there for the judge to exercise his uh, discretion and detain Trump. And he know I'm sure the judge and the district attorney's office as well is thinking, well, what happens when this goes up on appeal? You never know what the appellate court might do. But they can't be limited uh, and paralyzed by that. They have to take the action that is obviously necessary to restore the legitimacy of the proceedings, which otherwise I think has, has been going well. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, look again, I'm not a lawyer, but I would assume this is Merchan going out of his way to make sure whatever the verdict is in this case, is appeal proof and bending over backwards for Trump while it shouldn't be done. I mean, there's, there's no appeals court that's going to, well, I guess in um, New York, it's the, no, it is the appeals court. <laughs> they will eventually look at this and they'll be like, there's no way because Machan is going out of his way to bend over backwards to appease Trump in every single fashion. So, uh, I mean, I guess in that sense, he's he's doing his due diligence. But uh, so I, normally I feel like in in white collar cases like this, where there's the submission of evidence like documents or or phone records and such, uh, both parties typically tend to. Uh, um, I suppose they both they both stipulate that the the documents are what they are. But in this to, in this instance, Trump's legal team decided to make the prosecutors call witnesses like uh, the archivist at, <laughs> at CNN or whatever, and to validate these videos and such. And and typically, these things just add unnecessary unnecessary delays in these trials they dragged them out forever like what is your opinion on on trump's strategy or at least as it pertains to his legal team and dragging this out unnecessarily your observation is absolutely right often these things are stipulated to uh, much more often than not and it does drag it out uh but my sense is that trump isn't viewing this as a conventional case and it isn't he's not a conventional defendant and I think he knows if it goes down in any sort of a conventional way, he's cooked. The evidence here seems to be, so far it's very strong and he doesn't really, uh, I mean, other than maybe hoping, you know, one or more jurors just is so sympathetic to him that they're going to reject the evidence. I don't think he's going to be able to meet the evidence no matter what his lawyers do. So I think he, you know, this is all part and parcel of his sort of reptilian resistance and and his delay tactics, which overall have served him well. 
And even on a micro scale of this individual trial, he's going to try to drag it out. Um, if, you know, if he's going to make these custodians come in and just testify as to administrative or clerical things that aren't really an issue, and it's going to inconvenience the jury and the judge, I think he, he views it as a good thing. Um, and I don't know that he's wrong because I think otherwise he's he's going to be convicted. So he's got to do everything he can to to to, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the works. And um, and he's you know going to call the shots and, and he's t- trying to tell his attorneys what to do. And, and, and of course, it's risking pushing the attorneys into areas where they can themselves get into trouble. But they knew that when they signed on for this. And I think they are getting paid. People used to joke that as his attorney, he wouldn't get paid. But we know now that all these attorneys are getting paid and they're getting paid good money. And that's what, you know, Trump's not paying it, but he's getting other people to pay it. So I think the, you know, that increases the possibility that attorneys will just do what Trump says. Even Todd Blanche, who, you know, supposedly was claimed by many to be, you know, more of a, by the book guy and could be effective. I I, I don't think that's going to be the case here. I don't think Trump uh, cares if Blanche has any credibility with the court. Um, And I don't think he cares if he has any credibility with most of the jury. His strategy is just to try to get that, pick off that one juror who can cause a a hung hung jury. And so I, I think we might see a lot of, you know, we're not out of the woods yet and seeing certain disruptions and things of that nature. Right. So one more thing along this line of like these unusual delay tactics. Uh, now, I know some prosecutors were were concerned about the idea that there are, are numerous, well, I, I believe, three lawyers on the jury. And, and in this case, with these delay tactics, typically the the prosecution is not allowed to allude to the fact that Trump's lawyers are basically wasting the jury's time. <laughs> but I think if you have a couple of lawyers on the jury who are familiar with how this process typically plays out, they might actually look at this as pretty annoying and have an effect on on some of the deliberations with the jury. But I again, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily know that to be the case, but just my personal insight. I think that's probably right. I I agree with you there. Now, there's many different types of lawyers. I don't recall what these particular ones that are on the jury actually practiced in, whether they did litigation or something totally unrelated. But um, there's a good chance that they'll understand what this is. But But you're also right. They'll be instructed not to legitimately factor that in, in applying the law to the facts. Now, what that whether that strictly followed or not, we'll, we don't ever really know. But uh, the judge will give them an instruction that all of these legal rulings and um, other things that don't come into evidence are not to be considered by them. So there'll be that type of limiting instruction, too. And I think all that is, again, is going to contribute to Trump seeking to draw this out. He, if he can, I, I don't think he, it, you know, if this goes another month, I don't think he cares. No. Yeah, despite his his claims that he'd rather be out campaigning, I'm sure the last thing he wants is a conviction on his record. Um, So we can rewind back a little bit to some of the the first witness in the case. What do you think about the prosecution's game plan here of, in all intents and purposes, making David Pecker their star witness? Is this like an attempt to, to minimize some of the problems that might come with Michael Cohen's testimony or the testimony of Stormy Daniels and such? I think so. But I think even more than that, it worked out really well because uh, he, you know, as a prosecutor, you rarely get everything out without a, a hiccup. And and that happened here. I mean, um, obviously, uh, Pecker has his own um, implication in this. He could have been charged criminally. But that uh, he didn't shy away from that fact. He openly discussed the fact that he had signed non-prosecution agreements. And and he obviously doesn't really come across as somebody that bears an animus to Trump. He still considers themselves to be uh, friends and allies, you know, transactional of sort. I think Pecker himself is a, is sort of like Trump, the transactional guy, and probably to be in that business that he was in. I think Pecker That's specifically a, re- referred to Trump as a mentor. 
like a yes. it, which is a strange right. comparison, but okay. Um, I don't think I'd want to look it at it. Tells you a lot about the relationship between the two, and and I think it works for the prosecution because he didn't have an axe to grind. Uh, one of the criticisms of Michael Cohen is that he's got an axe to grind. But I mean, the, the Cohen's axe to grind, I think, is legitimate and doesn't necessarily mean he's not telling the truth. But here with Pecker, we don't have he, he's not grinding an axe. He does corroborate Cohen, but he also laid the, the whole scene out, the, the whole context for the illegality of it, the stakes that they understood what they were doing. Um was illegal or they they thought it well could have been but they understood also the importance for the election uh they felt like this is necessary that that, that this scheme they hatched and executed was necessary in order for trump to win whether that's right or not as the prosecution has said many times we don't really know but they certainly thought that was the case and it was not an unreasonable thought and he also laid out the whole landscape of this type of tabloid journalism if you really want to call it journalism but technically i guess it comes under that even though it has no regard for what actually happened um he was very open about it and the minor sort of concessions that came out on cross-examination where he had done similar things for arnold schwarzenegger and uh tiger woods uh, you know and other celebrities I, I don't think is a huge win for trump i i mean it doesn't mitigate what happened here and um, and it can be differentiated. I mean, if you thought that was bad, the, the, the thing with Trump is even a level worse. So w- with higher stakes. So I think and it caught the public's attention. It made people understand there are there is a significance to this trial. It's not just about business records being misclassified or, you know, running through something through the company that maybe shouldn't have been. It's a lot more. This was really all about illegally influencing the election. And they knew that. Yeah, speaking of the the falsification of business records, so in New York, typically uh, these are are charged as misdemeanors, and you basically have to bootstrap them up to a felony by showing they were committed in furtherance of of another crime. And what do you think about the prosecution strategy of basically starting off the trial with bootstrapping them up before they even get to the idea of the payments being the 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 records being falsified? Well, you always want to start the trial with a witness that's going to be engaging and sort of help paint a broader picture for what comes after. Uh, So it's not always um, a check the box thing. It's not always necessarily strictly chronological. Uh, And you have to recognize the jurors are people, you know, they're sitting there, uh, you know, morning to late afternoon every day. Uh, and you want to give them something interesting. You don't want to start with kind of a weak witness in terms of that witness's ability to engage with the jury. So Pecker is somebody that does uh, present a compelling story. And I'm sure, um, obviously, we don't. unfortunately, we don't have a camera in, but uh, the sense is, and certainly from the reports from people who are there, uh, is, are that the jury was engaged. So I, I think that kind of mandated, you know, Pecker is the obvious choice to to start with. And they can fill in the gaps later. Uh, but they've, you know, they've got other videos. Uh, there's going to be audio recordings, presumably, um, that'll come in and 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 obviously bank records and, and other documents. That's going to have to come in. But at least the jury is going to have some understanding of the broader picture when those things come in now and they won't be totally lost. So I think that was a good choice by the district attorney's office. Yeah, right. I think the the prosecution did a really good job of putting everything into a frame for the jury from the get go. So they have a lens to view uh, every piece of evidence that's presented after the fact. Um, But speaking of like creating an environment that's engaging for the jury, and this is like not legal analysis, but what do you think of the fact that Trump can't stay awake in the first criminal trial of a president, a former president in the history of the United States, like that he can't summon the attention to even stay awake. It's, it's beyond wild. Well, I'm kind of with you on that. I like the nickname you gave him or that you amplified Don Snorleone. Yes, that was I mean, me. I, I take credit for that. Yeah. yeah, that was good. That's very apt. 
I think if if he hadn't been calling his political opponent Sleepy Joe and <laughs> trying to make a big deal about that, then it might not have been so devastating. But I think politically, that's one of the worst things for him to come out of this is that this guy, and it's not just like he's falling asleep once. I mean, I think it's like a daily um, Every day. event. Yes. Yeah. Every day. So, you know, one can imagine, you know, easily a situation, you know, the, the the famous situation room, you know, drama, you know, do, do we, we have to call in airstrikes or go to war in Iran or wherever uh, the hotspots are. And um, everybody's, you know, making these, you know, detailed analyses. And Trump, as commander in chief, he's falling asleep. I mean, is that a visual that, you know, the electorate is going to go for? I think not. So I think that's a huge um a huge negative for him and um i'm i guess he's not taking questions in these you know kind of press announcements he's doing but i uh, i would think that somebody's got to be questioning him about that uh as well and who knows what he'll say maybe he'll deny that he's even doing it but everybody's seen him doing it so uh his denials i think will seem all the more ridiculous but maybe you know what else can he say I mean, it is extraordinarily weird that no one's asked him about that. But so we'll slightly move this back toward some some legal analysis. Like, what does it say about a defendant that won't even show like a judge and a jury and the prosecution the basic respect of staying awake? Like <laughs> if you're if you were like giving jury instructions as a judge and you're like, man, this dude didn't fell asleep in my court. I'm going to make it really tough on him to wiggle his way out of it. I mean, I, you know, look, I know judges don't probably don't take those things personally, but at some point, the level of disrespect just has to enter the minds of the judge and the jurors. Am I wrong? So far uh, in all the other cases, I think that disrespect has shown through. In the E. Jean Carroll case, when he got walloped with that second judgment, the first one was only five million, but obviously that didn't do the trick. So legally, it had to be ramped up. But I, it seems as if the, a big part of the whole calculation between that judge and jury was was his comportment in the courtroom. You know, getting up and walking around at inopportune times and things like that. Um, this judge, I think, is not having it. I think he's told that I think Judge Mershon has told Trump, you know, a few times, you know, to sit still or, um, you know, behave properly. Uh, so he's putting limits on it. So, I, um, I, yes, I think that's a big deal. Now, I have to say, I mean, I've seen jurors fall asleep in cases. I, I've even seen judges doze off um, at certain points. So, I mean, the days can get long. Um, although I don't think these days are particularly long in this trial. I mean, and they've only had two nominally full days uh, so far, I believe, or maybe today was the third one. Um, but, you know, anybody can can doze off. But if you're the defendant um, and it's all about you and you're purporting to direct your legal team and you're barking out orders and yet you're falling asleep, obviously it adds another layer of absurdity to the whole proceedings. And that's what we've got with Trump. It's yeah, a clown show. A clown show. My exact words that I was going to use, it's a clown show. Like, I've never seen anything like it. And look, again, the fact that we're even trying to talk about this is though it's completely normal. It's it's still beyond absurd to me, uh, even that degree of normalizing it, because I want to scream <laughs> about how ridiculous this is, but that would be inappropriate. Oh, uh, so earlier today, uh, the... The prosecution called Keith Davidson as a witness. Were you familiar with this testimony from earlier today? Yes, I, I followed along with that. I was uh, that was interesting to me because, it, you know, really, Keith Davidson had I mean, that wasn't entirely kosher, so to speak, his representation of Stormy Daniels and uh, Karen McDougal, because he seemed to be somewhat conflicted. He is he really representing them? And I think he was, but I don't know if he explained to his clients in the technically proper way that, you know, did he have some other conflicts because of his close relationships with, you know, the counterparties, you know, the AMI and and, and the and, and Pecker and uh, Dylan Howard. And is he really trying to get the best deal for them? Um, I think those are things legitimately that um, 
probably made him not the best attorney for them, although I don't think he was horrible. He did get them some um, some compensation, but it seems like given the stakes, he could have gotten a lot more. But um, but but, you know, but he's a legitimate attorney and he was trying to to work out transactions here. And I think his testimony can't comes across so far. You know, we'll have to see how it ends up and and get the full cross examination, obviously, to really fully assess it. But so far, I think uh, he also comes across as credible and it just adds more another layer of corroboration um and 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 another layer of strength to the case because he's really emphasizing also the stakes here they they knew that this was all about winning the election or not uh particularly obviously right after the access hollywood tapes he really drew the line there uh when that access hollywood story broke that that was a game changer um trump didn't care about <laughs> suppressing all this stuff before that which is deadly for Trump legally also, because one of his defenses that he's sort of proffered is that, well, obviously, this is embarrassing, uh, you know, personally. And and so, you know, these women are not that I'm saying they're, it's true what they're saying, but, you know, my family, my wife, I don't want them, uh, you know, being subjected to to these kinds of stories. So, sure, I, who wouldn't want to bury that? But actually, Trump is a different cat, right? He, he couldn't have cared less what his family thought about it. Wait, and can I stop you right making... there for a second? So let's say yeah. Trump really, let's say, given the situation, Trump is really just trying to hide this from from his wife and his family, right? Well, wouldn't he just cut a check from the Trump organization from the account that his family doesn't have any eyes on? Wouldn't that just be the simplest way to go about that? Absolutely would have been the simplest way. And if he had done that, it wouldn't really have violated any laws. It wouldn't have violated campaign finance laws. Um, but at every opportunity, he chose to make it much more complicated to track it. And and I mean, he's basically both Davidson and Pecker, and I'm sure other witnesses will say he had no interest in paying i mean he's kind of a cheapskate with that sort of stuff he had no interest in in hushing this story when it came to his family it was only when the electoral consequences became evident after that whole access hollywood uh recording dropped that he radically changed his tune um because it was for the election so it's absurd to think now given what we've heard that this was not about the election, but really just about his sensitivity to other people's feelings. Um, it, you know, all of the witness testimony, all of the texts and communications that have gone back and forth so far have shown that he had not a care in the world on the personal side about this. Um, you know, he probably didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I mean, I think he felt totally entitled to engage in this type of behavior. That seems to be more what the evidence is showing. But he did not want voters to be aware of it and to put that into a context where they might think this Access Hollywood tape was credible. And re and also, remember, Davidson was saying, you know, we, we all thought the election was over. I mean, there's communications he sent out at the time. Well, you know, those wave the white flag type of statements. He's not going to win now after this tape. Right. But Trump and I've made got this, this miraculous well, I have this one comeback. text message right here from Keith Davidson to Dylan Howard, I think the editor at, at the National Enquirer. And it's on election night when they're like, it's like <laughs> they're they're watching the news and they're like, oh, it looks like Trump might actually win. And the text message is, what have we done? And then Howard replied to, to Davidson, oh, my God. Like, that, is that not like, no, regardless of what that says about Trump's intent here, clearly Howard and Davidson were well aware that their actions had an impact on the election, if not totally responsible for his victory. And they were like in shock, I think, that they had kind of pulled it off. And that was one moment of humanity where they wondered, you know, are we responsible for what can happen here? And I, I think the answer to that is, either, yeah, they are responsible, among others. But uh, they, they, you know, all the harm that caused, I think, can somewhat be traced to them as well as other individuals. And that was a rare moment of honesty and self-reflection 
between them where where they recognized the significance of it. But but Trump recognized it, too, because all of a sudden he's willing to pay out. Um, He's he's putting pressure on Michael Cohen. You know, now we're getting we're getting the story of that sort of secondhand through Davidson and Pecker and these other text messages. But um, but but we can see that this corroborates very strongly that Trump understood the importance of getting all this out. And and Pecker, by the way, he testified that even after Trump was president, when he met Trump in the White House, and Trump was throwing a, a dinner in his honor. And what did they talk about? They were talking about this. They were talking about how's Karen my McDougal. girl. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he doesn't want to be briefed on the presidential daily briefing. Right. I mean, he famously couldn't sit through that for even 30 minutes. They had to dumb it down about all the crises in the world. You know, he didn't have the mind for that. But uh, but boy, can he spend a lot of time when it's about him being in power, Uh, whether it's plotting the insurrection or or seeing whether these uh, whether Stormy Daniels or Karen McDougal is going to say something that might affect his ability to stay in power he's all over that you know so it's very revealing and a total side note here but what do you think is like what is your take on him looping in hope hicks and sarah sanders in to basically a plot to cover up an affair to affect the election like what are you like this is the point at which we're it's the wire and we're like are you taking notes on a criminal conspiracy what are we doing like whose decision was that here's the wire but you know what he's rewriting the wire because <laughs> he you know he just doesn't he thinks all these people are going to go along with him. And he, you know, in the case of Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Hope Hicks, he was largely correct. Um, you know, in fact, I think James Comey was in one of these meetings, right? The right. FBI director. I, I think he was in a meeting with Pecker. I mean, any other person is going to be thinking, you know, you don't want these people involved, but he thinks they're all going to be with the program of covering this up. And he wasn't necessarily wrong on that. Um, you know, I think even Comey was still trying to get his bearings as to what was going on. But I think in Trump's mind, these people were all in on the criminal conspiracy. You know, they're they're with him. And uh, and that's why he gets furious when people break with him. Um, you know, he saves his harshest rhetoric for those people. It's it is really type of a, a mafia mentality, which many people have commented on. For sure. And you, you talk about the fact that he is, expects these people to engage in conspiracies to cover up his crimes and just takes that for granted. Have you even considered how just what a random event it is, like how random it is that the origin story for this investigation itself actually spun off from the Mueller investigation? Like this would never have happened. If Robert Mueller's team had never gotten access to some of the records from the Trump organization and been able to look at these payments and be like, huh, that seems suspicious. Let's let's spin that off to the Southern District of New York. And then there was also the opportunity for the Southern District to continue investing these investigating these crimes and potentially indict Trump once he left office. But it appears as though Bill Barr pulled some trickery. And part of the reason we're even experiencing and this trial is such a late stage is because, well, he basically called and killed the investigation, right? He was like, hey, Manhattan DA's office, don't worry about this. SDNY's got it. And then he's telling SDNY, hey, Ixnay on that investigation, eh? <laughs> like, it, just a weird tale that we've ended up in this place like this. Well, it's a disturbing tale because, and you know, and SDNY, out of all of the U.S. attorney's offices around the United States, they kind of held themselves out as uh, being the most independent. They called themselves, it's not the Southern District of New York, it's the Sovereign District of New York. Nobody tells us what to do. And people were sort of repeating that line, which was false. Um, Barr was having his, you know, minions and the the deputies and Rosenstein's deputies and uh, calling and putting pressure on it, even after Cohen had been prosecuted and convicted and sentenced to jail. Well, you know, so what kind of a message is that? Here, the exact same conduct, which benefits Trump, um, has resulted in the lower person being prosecuted and going to jail. 
But uh, but the prosecutorial authorities, in this case, the Southern District of New York, um, nominally being obviously a part of the Department of Justice, deciding, no, not to go through with it. it it's, it's a terrible look. And they have never really wanted to admit that, uh, that that happened. But 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 clearly that it did. And now in, instead, actually, they uh, other people on their behalf, I think, have tried to scapegoat Michael Cohen saying he wasn't credible. So how could they go forward? But Alvin Bragg in the district attorney's office has, has put the lie to that. Well, let's bring this back full circle. So, you know, Cohen does obviously have these credibility credibility issues. But one of the things we found out during the course of Packer's testimony is that he signed a non-prosecution agreement with the Manhattan DA's office in 2019. So if the Southern District of New York really wanted to pursue these charges, all they had to do was work their way up the chain to David Pecker, their star witness right there. I don't understand why is it they didn't take next steps on that, do any due diligence. I mean, obviously, you know, Bill Barr, unreliable narrator here with his take on on how that proceeded. Obviously, he had a hand in making sure this didn't go any further. But and we even had the instance of them, you know, erasing. Uh, numerous instances of mentions uh, of individual one and Cohen's indictment. Like it, it seems like the fix was in from the get go. Once Barr was, was that's right. I mean, that was the intervention on Trump's behalf by high ranking officials at the department of justice, which was inappropriate because it wasn't based on policy or equity or anything like that. It was just to serve Trump's personal needs. And that might've, uh, made it more difficult for the district attorney's office to go forward if they didn't know what the U.S. attorney's office was doing. Uh, if they thought they were going forward, they didn't want to duplicate it. Uh, so I think that made it harder. I, I, I think that was part of the issue there was that not only was there not cooperation from the federal side of it for the district attorney's office, but they might have felt that there was some interference there. Um, and it and, and that delayed it. I mean, eventually they probably realized, yeah, this isn't happening at the federal level. Um, should we go forward? And, and there was a whole tortuous history there where it looked like it wouldn't go forward for a while. But then they, they kept at it. And it you know looks like now they've got a, you know, a really strong case. But uh, and then the, the, the coup de grace, so to speak. Of uh, absurdity or uh, well, what I don't know is that the trial was almost derailed. It was certainly continued for about a month when it turned out that uh, the the U.S. Attorney's Office there in the Southern District had been subpoenaed, uh, uh, right? You know, lawfully subpoenaed and hadn't complied with it in a timely way. And then at the last minute, they dumped all kinds of documents um, on the case, and and that caused the delay. So they really were a negative uh influence here and we haven't gotten to the bottom of that a lot of what Barr did and caused to be done in the department has just been swept under the rug i mean people don't want to you know internally investigate that it seems but it's important for straightening things out going forward and for accountability and for writing a correct history here to try to understand what happened there so there's still a lot of questions with all of that Right. I'm I'm not a fan of news outlets having Bill Barr on in any fashion whatsoever, but I do have an example of the shell game that was being played at DOJ, uh, similar to what was going on with, you know, Manhattan's office in the Southern District of New York, uh, specifically Rod Rosenstein during the Mueller investigation, basically telling the FBI, hey, you know, Mueller's team will handle the counterintelligence aspect of the Russia investigation and then telling Mueller's team, hey, we're going to spin off the counterintelligence aspect of the investigation uh, to to the FBI like what kind of like it it seems as though once they come up with a strategy that works once they try to employ it over and over same thing with this catch and kill scheme i would imagine but uh one last thing before i let and, you and go. that's a great point we never got to the bottom of that and 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 the press hasn't gotten to the bottom of it so these are big things that need to be gotten to the bottom of, you know, what's going on with that. We don't, we've never gotten a straight answer on that. No, I've, I haven't forgotten. I, I think about it regularly. Uh, but yeah, one last thing before I let you go. Uh, Trump has made it publicly known that he's willing to testify. Obviously, we can't rely on anything Trump states publicly because clearly he's a known liar. But let's say you were 
Trump's legal counsel, what would you advise him to do in regards of uh, testifying in this case? And if he were to insist on testifying, like how would you coach him to kind of respond to the evidence that's been put forth so far? Obviously, we have no idea what what else is coming, but as far as what you're currently aware of. That's a great question, uh, because Trump probably is, you know, the world's worst witness. I mean, certainly one of the more difficult ones you can imagine. I did have somebody very, very similar uh, to him in a in a big trial, obviously not not of this you know, magnitude in terms of publicity and involving a former president, but someone with a very similar personality. Um, and uh, it's a it's a difficult call because you can't really run through their testimony with them. They won't cooperate. You don't know what they're going to say. Trump obviously being a known habitual liar. I think he understands enough that he doesn't really want to testify, even though he might find it in his interest to claim that he will. But for a normal witness in a case like this, or a normal defendant in a case like this, your client, if you're representing that person, that's the biggest part of your case. Because if that client can make the case, if he's credible or if he's believable uh, to the jury, he can get right up there and talk to them directly. And the jury's always going to have, uh, you know, an inquisitiveness about what the defendant is going to say. Yes, they're going to get instructed by the jur- the judge that if the defendant doesn't testify, you know, don't pay any attention to that. You don't draw anything negative for that. That's absolutely his right to do so. The defense will try to say, you know, he doesn't need to testify. The case case is so weak. What's the point? You know, there's nothing to be added here. But the jury's still going to wonder, boy, I, you know, um, I I wish he had gotten up there and testified. So you always want the client to testify. But I don't think Trump is fixable. So it's a really tough question. I don't think you can make him testify in a credible way, um, which doesn't make it worse. And here's the real issue. Um, Because you could say, look, he's probably going to go down in flames anyway. So maybe his testimony doesn't make it worse. Maybe he speaks to, you know, one sort of outlier, you know, irrational juror who who is just going to sympathize with him against all the evidence. But here's the risk, even with all that, is that when it comes to sentencing, the judge takes into consideration whether the testimony of the defendant was truthful or not. That is appropriate and even required factor in sentencing. Right. So it yeah, was typically judge it's, like it's Mer- difficult to get a conviction on something like perjury. But if it's in the course of your own trial, when it, it's time for sentencing, the judge is going to look at that like, oh, hey, you, you told a bunch of fibs on there, buddy. Let's tack on some extra time. Right. And that may be the difference between him going to jail or, or him not going to jail. So these these are big uh, issues. I but my, I don't think Trump will testify because I think he doesn't want to testify. Recall though that he did testify for about five minutes in front of Judge and Goron, but there was no jury there, so they gave him wide latitude to be ridiculous. Yes, that was actually I think Judge and Goron actually did him a disservice there uh, by letting him and his lawyers just run wild with the their approach in that case because they that did not prepare them for this endeavor in Merchon's court. But I do appreciate you for joining us. Thank you for so much for your input. Uh, tell everyone where they can find you on the, well, I guess it's no longer known as Twitter, but X, formerly Twitter. It's, uh, at Eric Lissan, at E-R-I-C-L-I-S-A-N-N. And uh, hopefully we can do this again or I'll get a, another, uh, I should expand into podcasting or YouTube type things. So uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, but but right now, X Twitter, uh, and I appreciate all your engagement there. Yeah, thank you so much. My pleasure.